Good morning. I'd like to welcome you guys to our video conference this morning brought to you by the Partnership for Environmental Education and Rural Health at Texas A&M College of Veterinary, and Medical, Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. I'd like to mention that this is brought to you by the Science and Education Partnership Board supported by the National Institutes of Health. Today we have a really great and timely presentation. It's entitled, Don't Let the Bugs Bite, Our Battle Against the Microbes That Want to Eat Us. We're lucky to have Dr. Ian Tizard here, Director of the Shubot Exotic Bird Health Center and Professor of Immunology and Pathobiology. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to Dr. Tizard. Good morning, everybody. I'm a veterinarian and an immunologist. And an immunologist is a science, scientist who studies the defenses of the body the defenses against infectious agents. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about our body's battle against all those horrible old microbes out there that want to eat us. We provide a source of food, a source of shelter, a great, great place to live if you're a bug. And there's an enormous diversity of bugs that are out there, bacteria and viruses and parasites and fungi that really want to live in our body. They don't want to mean us any harm, though sometimes they do cause disease. What they really want is a, just a, a neat place to live. So, our bodies are good to eat. Just, and, and these bugs attack us just the same way that a lion or a tiger or a bear would like to attack us as well. We're simply, simply a source of food. So, um, so, so if we're going to stay healthy, if, if we're going to be able to function, be able to act as uh, normally, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to keep those invaders out. We, you and me, all humans, all animals, are constantly fighting a battle to keep the invaders out. A battle that begins the day we're born, it works 24-7, and it lasts until the day we die. Because if we don't keep them out, if the bugs get in, then we're going to get sick, and if the bugs really win, we're going to die from infectious disease. So how do we keep these bugs out? What's, what's the principle? Well, think army. I want you to think of, of a military analogy. How do you defend a site? How do you defend a situation? The, clearly the easiest way to think about it is that we have multiple barriers, many different ways of keeping the invaders out. Uh, first of all, we maybe have fences and things like that. What you might think of as physical barriers, and then once, if anything, gets through those physical barriers, we need some sort of hardwired defenses that are going to attack and kill the invaders. That's what we call innate immunity. But finally, just to make sure that the invaders are kept out at all times, we need a very automatic defense mechanism, a mechanism that's going to keep all the invaders out pretty much all the time, and we call that adaptive immunity. So we're going to work through each of these layers of defense, going from the physical barriers to adaptive immunity, and we'll end up talking about how we can manipulate these systems to make us even more resistant to disease. Specifically, we're going to talk a bit about vaccines and vaccination because we can play with these defense systems in such a way that we're going to be defended and we can defend ourselves against some really nasty microorganisms that want to get in and really do want to cause a lot of damage. You can think of these defenses as occurring in, in layers. Uh, physical barriers come first and then the innate defenses and then the adaptive defenses, but they also occur in time as well. We need something that keeps the bugs out immediately, right? We, we want a, something that responds at once if 
if the flu virus gets into your body or a bacterium gets into your body, we don't want to hang around and wait for, for days or weeks just before we can get rid of it. We want to get rid of it very promptly. So each of those three layers of defense actually works in order. The physical barriers basically keep most bugs out. Innate immunity is a rapid response. And then adaptive immunity is a slower developing response. Let's talk for a moment about the physical barriers. Um, obviously, again, if we think army, if we think of a military situation, barbed wire fences, walls, castle walls, are all examples of physical barriers. And, and they're very good at keeping a lot of invaders out, especially invaders that aren't terribly enthusiastic, invaders that, that uh, are not very, very aggressive. Um, and in terms of our bodies, we can think of, uh, of our skin. Um, skin's tough, very tough, it heals up, right? If we have a cut in our skin, it heals, it keeps the microbes out. It's full of chemicals that kill microbes. But that's not to say that it's sterile. Our skin is actually covered in microbes, right? Different parts of our body have different microbes. That's why the person sitting next to you smells a little bit because of the microbes in their skin. But collectively, that skin barrier with its microbes and its antibacterial molecules is a very effective way of keeping invaders out. The only way really most invaders can get through your skin is either when you have a cut and the cut becomes infected, or perhaps a mosquito injects a microbes through your skin. But otherwise, skin's a really great, very effective barrier to microbial invasion. The skin, of course, is only one of our barriers, right? It's a very obvious barrier on the outside. But remember that we also have an intestine in our body with a large surface area. It, too, is full of bacteria. Um, and we defend ourselves against invaders through the intestine as well. Uh, simple things like vomiting is a way of getting rid of bad things. If you eat something bad, you might throw up. That's an example of a physical barrier. Or if the organism gets further down into your tummy, then you might get diarrhea, which is another way that your body uses to get rid of invaders. And in addition, the walls of our intestines are full of lots of chemicals and compounds that keep, keep the microbes out. The respiratory tract, where you breathe through, is, is a lot more difficult. And the reason for that is, of course, you need to let oxygen get in. Um, we have a number of mechanisms there, those simple mechanisms like coughing. Coughing is a defense mechanism. When you cough, you're blasting out the bad things that get into your airways. Likewise, when you sneeze, again, it's a defense mechanism. You're blasting out the bad things that get up your nose. Of course, you can always use your fingers as well. Um, Likewise, the walls of your airways are, are covered in sticky mucus that works like a flypaper and captures bacteria <coughs> that get, gets into, uh, into your lungs. And again, there's lots of chemicals there. So physical barriers are, in fact, a very effective way of keeping most microbes out. The trouble is they're not completely effective. After all, if you've got a big fence and you don't have any guards, someone can climb over the fence. Given enough time and effort, they can get in. So physical barriers are by themselves not sufficient to keep the microbes up. What we need are defenders as well. What we need are, is a system of stopping anything that gets through the physical barriers. And the, probably the, the neatest example I can think of is the, the attack on a castle. I'm sure you've all seen those old Robin Hood movies where the outlaws come out and try and climb the walls, and there's a big battle on the, on the battlements, and either the good guys win or lose, whatever. And that's a very good analogy for inflammation. In the case of inflammation, 
the microbes get into your body. Maybe they get in through a cut, or maybe they get in through, uh, through eating something that, that's inappropriate. Your body has to respond. It has to respond quickly. You don't want the microbes to establish a foothold. So the defenders, the, the defenders in the body come rushing to attack the microbes. What are these defenders? These defenders are specialized cells. They're the white cells that you find in the blood. Here's a, here's a blood sample. Uh, or this direction. Here's a blood sample. Uh, this came from Jumper the Goat, who, uh, who will be acknowledged in the, uh, in the uh, credits to this movie. Um, this is a blood sample from a goat. You can see the red blood cells <coughs> that are important for carrying oxygen. And this white area, much of this are the white cells. These white cells, they circulate in the blood. And as long as you're healthy, they just hang around there. They don't do very much, just waiting for things to happen. But if you get attacked, if the microbes get into your body, then those white cells come rushing into the tissues. And they try to kill, eat, and destroy the invaders just like the fight on the castle walls. It can be messy, it can be destructive, but as long as it happens quickly, many, many microbes can be killed. So I say it's, it's like having a physical fight with the invaders, the white cells. And here's a picture in this slide of a white cell uh, eating a, a, a yeast cell. You can see that it gobbles it up and destroys it. And as I say, but the problem is with these fights is that it causes all sorts of collateral damage. There's tissue damage. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. And someone has to tidy up afterwards, right? There is, there's a lot of, lot of tissue damage. So inflammation, while it's absolutely critical to the defense of the body, is in fact a bit of a double-edged sword. We really don't want to use inflammation too much. After all, if we mounted inflammation every time a bug got into our body, we'd be sick and painful all the time, and that isn't going to work. Just a comment or two about the white cells, the cells that defend the body against invaders. Uh, as I said, they normally circulate in your bloodstream. They simply basically patrol your body waiting for invasion to happen. There's, as you probably know, there's many different sorts of white cell in the blood. And they're sort of specialized cells. Some of them, like the neutrophils, are specialized killers of bacteria. Uh, some of them, like macrophages or monocytes you might have heard of, are, are not only bacterial killers, but their job is to clean up the mess. They're, they sort of and trigger wound healing. And then there's cells called lymphocytes who's, that are specialized in getting rid of viruses. And all these cells are attracted to places where your tissues are damaged or where bacteria or other invaders are growing. So that's essentially the essence of, of inflammation. Of course, the other thing you remember when you get inflamed, let's say you hit your thumb with a hammer or, or you get a, an infected cut, um, it gets red and hot as the blood flow increases. And that's the blood flow bringing the defenders, bringing the cells and some protective uh, chemicals to the tissues that are under attack. Um, yet maybe you, the organ might swell a little bit. You hit your thumb with a hammer and it might get red and swollen as, as fluid gets into the uh, site of inflammation. Um, can be awful painful sometimes. Pain is a sort of secondary effect, uh, but it seems to be related to uh, many of the antimicrobial chemicals that are produced in inflammation. And uh, as I say, it's uh, altogether inflammation, very, very effective, but it works. It's a very good way of, of getting rid of the invaders, returning the, the, nor the dead and dying tissues to normal, basically tidying up the mess. But I say it's, there's a limitation to just how much inflammation your body can handle. 
right? Too much inflammation, you're going to be uncomfortable. Things are going to be red and swollen. It's really not the ultimate answer to the defense of the body. What we need is something a lot more sophisticated, right? One reason we need things that are a lot more sophisticated is the microbes fight back. This really is a war, and these are really battles, right? Our body is fighting to defend us against invaders, but the microbes want to get in. They desperately want to get in so they can kill the white cells, the leukocytes. They can hide in dead tissues. They can hide inside cells. Microbes have many different tricks under their, uh, up their sleeve to get into the body and take over. So it really is a war. Disease and sickness reflect a battle in your body going on between the invading microbes and the defenses of the body. We need something in the long run. If we're going to live long, happy, healthy lives, we need something that's going to be much more effective than that. Something that's automatic, something that doesn't cause pain, something that isn't uncomfortable. And we need, we need an automatic, non-damaging, painless, effective, smart immune system. And we call this the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is much more powerful than, than physical barriers, much more powerful than innate immunity, and much more effective in defending the body against invaders. It's essentially an automatic smart system that, that will keep the invaders out. Let me introduce a word here, a useful little word called antigen. We use the word antigen in immunology to describe anything that triggers an adaptive immune response. So an antigen can be a bacterium, it can be a virus, it can be a parasite, it can sometimes be something in your food. But the general term for something that triggers an adaptive immune response is antigen. <coughs> the other thing to remember about the adaptive immune system is that it's really got its work cut out for it. You think of what's out there trying to get us. There's bacteria, right? Lots of bacteria out there that, like Salmonella you've probably heard of, or E. coli, that can get into our body and infect wounds, cause diarrhea, and so forth. So this immune system has to defend us against bacteria. What about viruses? has to defend us against viruses too, right? Things like influenza and the viruses that are circulating in our communities right now. Sometimes fungi, fungi invade the body. Uh, some of you might have got athlete's foot, for example, or even, heaven forbid, ringworm, which are fungal infections. And of course, in many parts of the world, people get infected with worms. So all of these things we've got to defend ourselves against. And that means that the adaptive immune system is complicated. Whether we like it or not, it's a complicated system because it has to defend us against everything. And each of these invaders, though, but each of these invaders essentially consists of, of antigens. We're going to focus today on bacteria and viruses because they, in many ways, are the most important of these invaders. And I, I want to remind you of something that's very, very important. Viruses and bacteria are very different sort of organisms. They are not synonymous. The two words do not mean the same thing. Don't confuse them. Bacteria are fairly big. The blue rectangle in this slide shows you the relative size of a bacterium. And the little red dot, is this, uh, oops. the little red dot shows you the relative size of a virus. Now, if you look down a microscope, looking, you can see bacteria. They're pretty small, but you can see them on a light microscope. But the virus is just too small to see, and that's why you actually need specialized electron microscopes. Viruses are much, much smaller than bacteria. 
Viruses also tend to live inside cells. Well, they have to live inside cells. Bacteria can live outside cells. And for example, when you go to the doctor, bacteria are killed by antibiotics, whereas viruses aren't. So bear that in mind when we, when we look at how the immune response handles, handles uh, bacteria. Basically, we, we essentially have two main branches for adaptive immunity. One deals with bacteria, one deals with viruses. So if bacteria get into your body, uh, the immune system, they can be killed with, uh, with white cells, like uh, as in inflammation. Uh, white cells can come and simply gobble them up and kill them. Um, there are mechanisms in the body for actually punching holes in bacteria, the stuff called complement that punches holes in bacteria. Um, sometimes some bacteria hide inside cells and there have to be mechanisms for uh, for killing those intracellular bacteria. Um, what about toxins? Some, some bacteria produce poisons. They've all got to be neutralized. And how does the body handle all these things? Well, it uses proteins called antibodies. Okay, here's, here's a diagram of, uh, of an antibody. Uh, but you can think of it as, uh, as a Y-shaped molecule. Or, or look at me. Uh, can you switch to me? Okay, here I'm, I'm acting like an antibody, and my hands grab onto the antigens. My hands grab any invaders that come in, and my feet attach, either attach to white cells or to other molecules that can kill the bacteria. So in effect, antibodies grab invaders and then force their destruction. And antibodies are especially good against bacteria. So that's one branch of the immune system. But what about viruses? Well, the problem with viruses is they live inside cells. And inside cells, antibodies don't go inside cells. So viruses have to, have to be killed in a completely different way. And the way the body handles that is it literally kills any virus-infected cells. So a virus gets into your body. It gets inside your cells. The virus-infected cell is then destroyed by your immune system, by a process we call cell-mediated immunity. It's the second big branch of adaptive immunity. Now, this is a pretty drastic solution, you'll agree. After all, killing virus-infected cells does cause damage. But it's really the only, well, it's basically the way the body does it. So, so Getting rid of viruses is a much more difficult job, really, than getting rid of bacteria. The other reason it's difficult to get rid of viruses compared to bacteria is that bacteria, of course, can go and live outside the body. They're on the seat you're sitting on, they're on the walls behind you, they're on the carpet. Bacteria can live in a lot of places. Viruses have got to live in your body. If they don't get into your body, then they're not going to survive. And that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem for them. So here's simply a diagram showing how a vir viruses get into a virus-infected cell. They, uh, the cell actually then sends a signal to the outside saying, help, I'm infected by a virus. And the virus, it, the, this virus-infected cell is killed by what's called a cytotoxic T cell. And that, in turn, kills the virus-infected cell. And if it's done right, then, then one gets rid of the virus out of the body. So let me just compare for you the two sorts of adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity to bacteria, adaptive immunity to viruses. Antibacterial immunity caused by antibodies. Sometimes you might hear the word humoral. And antibodies are produced by a sort of cell called a B cell you didn't worry about. Viruses, on the other hand, Antibodies are not very effective against viruses. They have to be killed by T cells or cell-mediated immunity that acts by killing virus-infected cells. So, as I say, what happens when, when bacteria get into the body? They're recognized as foreign. Their antigens are recognized as foreign. They're actually picked up by cells that recognize them. And um, 
tell the B cells, the B cells make antibodies, the antibodies kill the bacteria. But one of the key things, and the, really the secret to the success of our immune system, is it remembers the experience. <clears throat> it remembers the encounter, and it can come back and do it again. Likewise, when T cells, in, or when viruses infect the body, T cells remember the experience. Because every time we encounter an invader, every, every time a microbe gets into our body and we respond to it, we develop a memory. Our immune system has a memory. We have somebody that's unmuted their mic. If you could please make sure you move that mic back. Thank you. The secret to the success of the immune system is this memory. Remember we talked a little while ago about inflammation. Inflammation doesn't have a memory. Inflammation happens the same way every time. You hit your thumb with a hammer today, it'll get red and swollen. You hit your thumb with a hammer tomorrow, it'll get red and swollen. There's no memory there. But as far as the immune response is concerned, the adaptive immune response, it has a memory. It remembers all the microbes that you've encountered in your life, and it responds much more effectively to them. And it's not only is this memory enable it to respond faster, but it responds better. The more we encounter a bug, the more we encounter a microbe, the better will we respond to it. And that's the basis. That's why we use the process of vaccination. We can actually accelerate the immune system. We can enhance immunity by vaccinating uh, an individual. <clears throat> this little graph sort of depicts what happens when you get a vaccine, right? The, you go to the doctor, the nurse gives you an injection, she injects the vaccine, or in this case, an antigen, and you make an immune response. It's not a very good immune response, usually the first time. You have to, a single shot for many vaccines helps a little bit, but is not perfect. You've got to go back to the doctor about a month later, a couple of weeks later, and you're going to get a second shot. You're going to get a booster shot. And your body recognizes the antigens in that vaccine and makes a really great immune response. That's why for many vaccines, you need to go back to the doctor and have multiple injections. And the more you go back, the more effective is the vaccine going to be and the more immunity you're going to have. So vaccines are a way of really fooling the body into thinking it's been invaded, triggering an immune response and causing, and, and, and causing protection uh, to, to, to develop. Every time you encounter an invader, either naturally by a vaccine, you respond better and better. So as you get older, you get a better immune response. That's also why little kids, little kids have runny snotty noses, because their immune system isn't terribly strong. But as you get older, your immune system gets better and better. So a vaccine is simply a preparation containing the antigens from a bacterium or a virus that we can use to trigger an immune response. And we can do it in our own good time, and we can do it before the invader gets in. In effect, what we're doing is we're mimicking a natural infection. We're fooling the immune response. We're telling the body, hey, you're under attack. It mounts an immune response, and you enhance it by uh, booster shots, and of course, it works very well, as long as we keep the process safe and effective, right? That's the key to vaccination. It's got to be safe. There's no point in giving a vaccine to somebody if it's going to make them deadly sick or anything like that. Let's, uh, one way, one simple rule, or at least one way of looking at vaccines, is we have a choice of different ways we can make vaccines. Some vaccines, as say, are living viruses. Some, some are, are dead. But they work so well that they're really critical to the reduced importance of infectious diseases in Western society, in our society. A hundred years ago, children like you would have been at great risk from a whole diversity of 
infectious agents. You'd have had a whooping cough, measles, polio. All of these would have been a cause for, for concern. Vaccines have protected them. Let's consider something that we probably all talked a little bit about, and certainly down here in Texas we have a big issue, um, is uh, vaccination against influenza. Good example. Uh, influenza, of course, is caused by a virus, um, and one needs uh, to vaccinate against it. It's a, it's a rather unusual virus because it changes every year. Um, this is part of the virus's survival strategy, the strategy to, uh, to keep invading the body. That's why flu comes every fall, every winter time. We have a flu season because the virus is constantly changing. So in order to protect us against influenza, we need flu vaccine. We generally make a new flu vaccine every year in order to ensure that we get protection each year. This year we have two general sorts of flu vaccine. We have what's called the live vaccine that actually contains influenza virus that cannot cause disease. And that vaccine, you put up the nose. How many of you have had the, the flu virus up your nose? It's called flu mist, right? And you basically, it's, it's pretty good for people who don't like injections. It goes up your nose and it, it can sort of could cause stuffiness and make you feel not so good for a day or two. But essentially, it's a great way of getting the antigen into the body, getting the vaccine into the body, and triggering a powerful immune response. The alternative that we use too, that many of your doctor might also offer you, is, is simply an injection to inject the vaccine. That's generally a dead virus. It, it, it won't cause any, so many side effects. And, uh, and of course, it, it triggers an immune response. Now, people are saying, well, this year, the vaccine only is 60% effective. That's because the virus is changing a lot. But bear in mind that Vaccines not only can prevent disease, which of course is what we really would like them to do, but even if they don't prevent disease, they can make it milder. So I would strongly encourage you, all of you, to get your flu shot if you haven't. Flu is a nasty disease, and the last thing you want is to be off for several weeks with this nasty virus infection. But flu is just one example of a vaccine, a way of adapting to the immune response and using it to our own purposes to bring infectious diseases under control. Okay, I think uh, that's probably a good time to stop. Okay. And uh, I'll be happy to answer questions uh, about this. I'm going to go ahead and um, a couple of the interactive sites have actually submitted their questions ahead of time. So I have a couple of questions here for for you. The first set of questions is from Mr. Bodkin's class and Wellesley uh, Middle School. This is in Boston, Massachusetts. And one that goes, one of their questions that goes right along with what you were talking about is, um, why do you think the flu virus has spread so quickly there in Boston? And of course, we're also finding it spreading very quickly here in Texas. So why does the flu virus, why is it spread so quickly? Well simply because the virus is different this year. Uh, as I indicated to you, flu influenza is a constantly changing virus. Um, it's one of these viruses that's trying to overcome the immune system. It needs to get into humans in order to survive. It needs, in fact, it needs to cause disease in order to survive. It needs to cause coughing and sneezing. And, uh, and this particular virus this year, after several years of fairly mild viruses, seems to be a much more aggressive strain and seems to be much more able to and get into humans and be shed in, in larger amounts. It varies a lot from year to year, influenza, as it, as it undergoes what are, in effect, mutations. It mutates all the time. But this is what makes influenza a rather unusual disease from our point of view. Most diseases, you get them once and that's the end of it. But flu, remember, comes back every year. Okay, very good. Um, the second question they had was, how actually does that flu virus change from season to season? How does it change? Well, it's because it's got a very curious genetic makeup. Um, essentially, it, it's, uh, 
when cells divide, any cells divide, basically the, the nucleic acid, the DNA, is copied, and it's generally copied very accurately so that there's no mistakes made. But influenza viruses, first of all, they use a different nucleic acid, but they also don't correct any mistakes. They have no procedure for fixing misprints, fixing spelling mistakes, fixing typographical errors, which means that as influenza grows in your body, the new viruses that are produced in many cases are a little bit different from the parent strain. And so given time, given six months, given a year, the virus may end up as being quite a different virus than you started with uh, six months previously. Um, I'm going to switch now to a couple of questions. Um, these are from Ms. Minter's class in Galveston ISD. It looks like it's middle school and high school students. And it says, are there more of these bugs or bacteria and viruses in some places than in others? Yes. Hygiene's important. Um, bugs, of course, are spread between people. So if you're going to live by yourself in the middle of the desert, you're probably going to stay fairly healthy you can feed yourself. Uh, likewise, in a crowded city situation, in a crowded classroom, obviously you're going to share bugs with your friends and neighbors. Somebody sneezes in the classroom, you're going to, to share more bugs. Uh, there's also, of course, the, the issue of hygiene. There are places that are dirty. Um, uh, you know, floors, uh, places where there's a lot of people, washrooms, there's clearly a lot more bugs. Than, uh, and microbes than there are out in, in, in the outdoors, in the playground, and things like that. So clearly the risk of getting infectious agents varies from, from, from place to place. Uh, and a lot of it, of course, also centers on hygiene and your behavior, right? Hand washing is critically important to minimize your chances of getting, getting infectious agents. So that kind of answers their next question about what they can do to keep the bad ones away. So besides vaccination, hygiene, hand washing, any other suggestions that you could add on Hi that? Hi hygiene is by far, hygiene in general is by far the best way to keep infectious diseases away. And of course that includes not just washing your hands, but for example, uh, we get many bugs from food, so you want to cook your food properly um, and, and, and things like that. You want to wash wash your food properly. Hygiene, in a general sense, is the, is, the, is the best way to stop getting these bugs in the first place. Very good. We also have McKeesport in Pennsylvania. If you guys want to unmute your mics, do you have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Tazar? Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I think their question is why, uh, even though you get a flu shot, you could still get the flu. And okay, is it a worse questions. form or a better form? <laughs> it's a better form, but it's a good question. Um, as I said, it, flu changes from year to year. And sometime last February, a committee got together to try and work out what was going to happen this winter. They essentially had to guess. They, they had to sit, they sat down, and they tried to guess whether what the flu virus would be like in the winter of 2012, 2013. And most years, they do this every year, most years they're really, really good at predicting what the virus is going to be like. This year they missed by a little bit. So the vaccine that was produced for this flu season isn't quite as good as we would like. But that said, it works. It works, as I say, the, the figure that is circulating is about 60% effective. But bear in mind, that's not a question of just preventing the disease. But if you're vaccinated and you get the disease, it's going to be much milder. It's going to be of shorter duration. Anything you can do to give your immune system an advantage in dealing with this critter is good for you and is going to give you a much milder disease. Okay. Do you have a, another question, McKeesport? Okay, we also have um, Anna Wack in Texas. Yeah, we have one more. Go ahead. She's coming up here now. <laughs> Can you get the flu from your flu shot? 
Ah, great question. <laughs> that is a really good question. Yes, is the answer. Um, remember I mentioned to you there's two different sorts of flu shots, there's live and dead? Well, don't worry about the dead. You can't get the flu if the virus is killed. But the, the intranasal virus, the so-called flu mist, contains live virus. Uh, it has to contain live virus because if we simply squirted dead virus up your nose, you'd simply sneeze it out again and that wouldn't do you any good. So, so the intranasal flu virus contains living virus and, and the, it's sort of set up in such a way as to grow a little bit in your nose and then trigger immunity. The trouble is that if your immune system isn't super strong in a few people, it can actually make you a little bit sick. Uh, my granddaughter actually got sick following her intranasal flu vaccine. She developed a fever for a couple of days as her body fought off this, the vaccine. So yes, you can get mild influenza as a result of, leaving the, of receiving the live vaccine. Okay, that's a great question. Now, do we have Anahuac Texas with us as well on the uh, interactive? Are you guys out there? Okay, I do have a couple of other questions from uh, Mr. Bodkin's class that we might want to talk about. And one of them is, uh, Dr. Tizard, you're the head of the Shubat Bird Center. Why did you choose birds over other animals to study? Well, I, I, I've worked on all sorts of animals in my career, and I only turned to, to birds relatively recently. Um, and I'm interested specifically in, in bird viruses and viruses that circulate in wild birds, and there's a lot of real, really interesting ones. A lot of it reflects the fact that, especially with exotic birds, we don't know a lot about their immune system. We don't know a lot about their diseases. Okay. Great question, and here's one that's real timely um, for people in Texas. My horse earlier this year got West Nile virus, and that comes from a bird, and people can also get this. And one of their question was, how and which microorganisms are able to move from the birds to humans? Well, first of all, you have to, are we talking about wild birds? Are we talking about chickens in your food? Um, clearly, one of the major risks of food poisoning in this society is if you don't cook poultry properly. Um, organisms like their bacteria, salmonella, that, for example, that occurs in, uh, in chickens and unless if you don't prepare it properly, if you don't wash your hands when you're handling it, you can certainly get diseases like that from, from, from improperly cooked poultry. When you get to wild birds, however, there's very few examples of, of diseases that can spread from wild birds to humans. Uh, there's a disease called parrot fever that sometimes can spread from parrots, but, the, but it's really very well controlled. And then West Nile virus, as, as our moderator pointed out, is carried by wild birds, but of course transmitted by mosquitoes. So, uh, so there, are, there are a few, but not many. Think about how different uh, birds and humans are. I have one question. <clears throat> well, what would you like to ask, Dr. Johnson? Uh, how does natural selection involve in uh, selecting out a, a bad type of, of uh, virus? Well, obviously sort of viruses vary in how severe they cause disease, uh, what sort of disease they cause, and how well they're spread. And obviously some viruses, some horrible viruses, like for example you might have heard of Ebola in Africa, kills people so fast that in fact it really doesn't spread very effectively. SARS is another example of such a virus. You think, think about if you were designing an ideal virus, you'd want one, well, flu is a very good example, one that would sort of spread between lots of people, it would spread very easily. Making people sick isn't really part of the virus's plan, right? It, it, the virus doesn't get any, great, any advantage of sickening you. So one gets a sort of selection pressure in that viruses that kill people very fast tend to be eliminated very quickly from the population. The viruses that survive and persist, and like influenza, come back year after year, are the viruses that maybe kill some people, but most people they simply make uncomfortable, and, but they, they persist in the population. 
Well, we've come to the end of our video conference today, and those were wonderful questions, I have to say. And we really appreciate Dr. Tizard visiting with us today, and uh, I'd like to give him a round of applause. Thank you. And I'd like to remind you that this video conference is brought to you by the Partnership for Environmental Education and Rural Health at Texas A&M University through the Science and Education Partnership Award at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you all, and remember that we will be posting a video, uh, a video recording of this conference and the associated PowerPoint on our website that you can get from your registration information. Thank you very much for joining us today.